Now we're going to discuss what happens to somebody who has end-stage renal disease. Medications hasn't worked, fluid restriction hasn't worked. At this point, the patient is unable to filter out their blood and to have good acid base and balance and fluid volume balance. So what comes next? Well, renal replacement therapy comes next. So in addition to some diet changes, medication adjustments, fluid restrictions, we can add dialysis to help the person who has end-stage renal disease. Many people can survive years on dialysis. However, some patients can only live a few months. Dialysis does not replace the hormone function of the kidneys. In fact, when we look at the function of dialysis, it does four things. It rids the body of excess fluids and electrolytes. It achieves acid-base balance. It eliminates waste products. And number four, it restores internal homeostasis by means of osmosis, diffusion, and ultrafiltration. Besides chronic kidney disease, you can also perform dialysis for a few other reasons. The ones I'm thinking of are drug overdose, persistent hyperkalemia, say from another non-kidney cause, hypervolemia, unresponsive to diuretics, and for somebody who has severe acidosis, meaning their pH is less than 7.2. And FYI, if your pH is in the sixes, you're pretty darn near close to death. So hemodialysis is usually done three times per week for three to five hour sessions. What happens are two needles are gonna be inserted, one into the quote unquote artery and the other into the quote unquote vein. Officially, it is the actual uh, same vein, but one is placed a few inches from the other site. And they say that is the one is the arterial and one is the venous. However, once again, they are both, uh, a vein is stuck for both situations. Now, peritoneal dialysis is done seven days a week. We're first gonna discuss hemodialysis. Well, how are you gonna do hemodialysis? Well, we can give them an AV fistula. That stands for arteriovenous fistula. Patients will not have an artificial or a synthetic uh, tube inserted in their arm, none of that. What we're going to do is have a vascular surgeon actually attach their artery to a vein, or maybe I should say a vein to an artery. The downside to having an AV fistula is that it takes time for the vein to mature, to grow. Uh, usually it needs about two to four months for this maturity to happen. The venous walls will begin to thicken and to enlarge, and this is done from just the pressure of somebody's own artery. The reason we need this is because we want the vein to be able to handle about um, a fluid coming and going into it about 250, maybe 400 mLs per hour. That's pretty darn fast. So we need a solid access site. We are going to ask the patient uh, which one is their non-dominant hand because that is probably where the AV fistula is gonna go. There's some pros to this. The AV fistula, because it's the patient's own um, body and tissue, there's fewer complications. There are lower infection rates, fewer incidences of clotting, that's a plus. Not to mention there's fewer hospitalizations and procedures for vascular, vascular access complications. They tend to last longer and literature shows that an AV fistula is successful 75% of the time that it is placed. Here on my left is a picture of an AV fistula in an upper arm. There on my right is where a patient's upper arm, maybe their veins were not a good candidate. So what they did is they actually tied um, and made an AV fistula on the lower arm. It really just depends on the patient if they're gonna do an upper arm or the lower arm. 
But here's the thing, if I do a lower arm fistula, I probably cannot tie that off and do an upper arm. You only really get four sites to do an AV fistula, the left arm, the right arm, the left leg, and the right leg. Here is another type of access that we can use for hemodialysis. This is a AV graft. Now, side note, in report, a lot of times nurses will use the words interchangeably. Oh, they have an AV fistula. Oh, they have an AV graft. However, they are definitely two different things. And if you ask a patient, they might be able to clarify for you, no, this is not a graft, this is a fistula. Or, this is not a fistula, this is a graft. And there is a reason for the difference. So, AV grafts. This is very useful when an AV fistula maybe doesn't mature or when complications uh, from the AV fistula limit the use of it. Maybe it just is too narrow, it keeps clotting, and what a vascular surgeon will do is actually insert this, um, uh, this material, this tube, into a patient. I believe it's made of polyethylene. Oh, I didn't write it down. Wonderful. Um, it's a synthetic material that will actually act as a connection between the artery and the vein. Uh, we know that grafts are very commonly used in older adults. They don't have this long maturity time, so they can actually be used in about three to four weeks. That's fantastic if you have somebody whose kidneys are failing fast. We can insert them under somebody's forearm their upper arm or their thigh. Once again, the ends, one end will tie into the artery and the other end will connect into the vein. The graft may be in the shape of a horseshoe or it can actually be straight. It just sort of depends. That blank right there, if you're looking at it, um, is the timeline. They can be used in three to four weeks. And just FYI, in case you're wondering what the word cannulation means, that's fancy for being stuck. So initially easier sticking and monitoring. Cannulation is just a term used in, um, so like OR or anytime you're accessing a vessel, they call it cannulating. Good. Uh, some of the cons to an AV fistula is, well, it's really not intended for long-term use. Maybe a patient um, is going to get a kidney transplant, or maybe they are hoping that another access site, uh, maybe when a patient's more stable, they can make an AV fistula. There's a couple different reasons, but we're not going to have a graft as long as an AV fistula. Here is a um, example of a vascular access device. We call these tessios, right, or hemodialysis catheters. What's nice is you don't have to stick a needle anywhere. It is ready for immediate use. This is a plus, especially if somebody's kidneys have failed and they need, they need dialysis like today. We don't have two to four weeks or two to four months to wait. A lot of times what a doctor will do is they will insert one of these and they will schedule a patient the procedure to have an AV fistula. And in the meantime, if somebody's kidneys are bad, they will use this. And then while we're waiting, the fistula will be uh, maturing. And then once the fistula matures and they try dialysis through it a few times, they actually will then come by and discontinue that because it is no longer needed. Here is a con. It has got a really high risk for bacteremia. This is their lifeline. In fact, nurses, are they allowed to use this for IV fluids? Mm, the answer is a big no. There actually is heparin, a high dose heparin that is inserted inside these lumens. The dose is about 1000 units per ml, which is kind of a lot. Uh, and so 
nurses are not allowed to use this because that one there's heparin sitting inside these lumens here if we under very special circumstances have absolutely no IV access and this is the only way to give this patient medications or to take blood we do have to get a provider order to use it for IV fluids and if that's the case the nurse will use their syringe they will actually evacuate about 10 cc's of blood from the tubing like they will aspirate the blood so the blood will come out and the heparin that's in there come out then we can flush it give our medication or maybe take blood and then we are going to reinstill our heparin inside there because the patient will need to use it for dialysis and I guess every other day okay Doo -doo 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 -doo. Uh, oh yes cannot shower or swim and there are two types of vascular access devices I'm going to show you what the differences are on the next slide here we are all right so this one right here is a temporary uh, central or temporary hemodialysis catheter as you notice it is in the neck that is the worst and most inconvenient place you can ever stick a catheter one because it is on their neck and their face is constantly moving their head is swiveling turning right and left looking up and down and it is sutured in right here and it can tend to um, the patient reports that it like stings a little bit as they're moving and the little sutures are pulling not to mention that that tegaderm that we use let me erase those right there yeah there we go the tegaderm that we use to play over his guess what the tegaderm covers that's right their hair that was awful arrow yep when their hair is caught up in the tegaderm the tegaderm tends to fall off easy and god forbid somebody has a beard um, a male patient that makes it really tricky to keep this IV catheter in place and to keep it nice and clean and sterile now these temporary catheters are used for about two weeks after two weeks time it is time to get them taken out and we will actually place a tunneled catheter as seen here tunneled catheter now the slide before you the slide prior to this go back and visit it and let me know was that a tunneled catheter or was it a temporary catheter and as you come back and look it was actually a tunneled catheter what's interesting about that one is this is actually where it's exiting the skin but believe it or not the catheter is actually going up under the skin and it is inserted into the neck as so what is really interesting is if you have a patient who's very thin uh, skinny you know low BMI you can actually see the tube and you can feel it going under their skin and you can feel it going up over their collarbone and it disappears inside their neck now let me throw this out there we as nurses are able to discontinue one of these but not the other we are able to discontinue of course with an order a temporary hemodialysis catheter what we do is we lay the patient flat we snip the little sutures out right here we ask them to take a deep breath and hold it and then we will pull the catheter out and hold pressure right here okay so that is where we are able to uh, to take these out now a tunneled hemodialysis catheter actually requires a nurse practitioner or a PA or a physician reason being is this little cuff right here is designed so that the skin will grow onto the cuff this is going to prevent infection from ascending up the line and going into the vein and it will allow the catheter to stay in place a little bit better even though it's going to be sutured in here a lot of times those sutures fall out so um, to be able to get this catheter out this tunneled catheter a nurse practitioner or whoever is specially trained that provider is actually going to stick an instrument up here and cut the skin away 
So once they cut the skin away, they are going to very slowly pull this catheter back out. And then when it comes out, you'll notice that the patient is still lying flat. This is to prevent an air embolism, but the patient is lying flat and the nurse practitioner will actually hold pressure here and they will hold pressure here make sure uh, sometimes the nurse will assist and hold pressure in one spot over the other. Great. So now you know how to care for them. This one's only two weeks. This one can stay from like, yeah, six months maybe um, or to a year. And if a patient has no more access sites, meaning they don't have any more fistulas, no more grafts, this will honestly be a permanent fixture they will have to have it for life because otherwise how else are you going to clean their blood? Maybe a transplant? Before our patient has hemodialysis, we have to do a few things and we have to know a few things. First things first is grab a consent. Now, most offices have one consent on file for this patient, so we don't have to get repeated consents. Um, if they are coming back and forth, say, to a DaVita clinic or something, you know, three times a week. But if they are new to your hospital, they do need to get a consent. Most oftentimes, the hemodialysis nurse will be the one to do this. Okay, um, we need to assess the patency of the long-term device. Um, and this, I'm specifically speaking about a fistula or a graft. Let me do this. Fistula, yeah, yeah, or a graft. We need to do these two things. What are we going to do? Well, we are going to assess for the presence of a brewy. A brewy is a swishing sound that you can hear. You're going to take your stethoscope, lay it directly over somebody's fistula, and listen. What you're going to hear is a very loud that is a good sound. I want to hear that. If I don't hear it, or if it's very like quiet and muffled, that means there is an occlusion. That has to be fixed. We have to report it to the physician because if I can't hear a brewery, how are they going to get dialysis? It's occluded. It doesn't work. We need an intervention for it. So assess the presence of a brewery and you do that by auscultating the fistula or the graft. This next one here is feel for the palpable thrill. We we're gonna feel a thrill. Oh, let's see, I can do this. Oh yeah, I can totally do this. Yep, I should spend my time over wisely. Okay, what do I mean by feel for the thrill? You're gonna put your fingers, well, gloved hands, I guess, over the fistula, and you're gonna push down very gently, and we should be able to feel a buzz, like zzz, zzz, zzz. That is a that's called a palpable thrill. How about if I don't feel a thrill or if it's very, very minimal? That's another sign that our fistula or graft is occluded or pinched off or something. There's not blood flowing through it. That turbulent blood flow is what we're feeling. So call the doctor. We must have a brewy. We must have a thrill. And this one here, there's two more. We must have pulses. And I'm talking about in their wrist, we must have radial pulses. So you're going to go below the access design site and feel for palpable pulses. And then I guess if they have a leg, you would check their pedals. You get it. This one right here, they must have good circulation. So good cap refill. That means everything is fine and we can access this device. Now, what are we going to avoid? You're going to avoid taking blood pressures in that arm. You're going to avoid administering injections in that arm. And I mean sub-Q injections, right? I said sub-Q. You're going to have to go to the other arm. We cannot have any possible. We have to lower the risk of infection to that arm. I know we're still poking them somewhere else. I get it but they can get a localized infection and that can cross over and migrate into their fistula. We don't need that. So avoid taking blood pressures, avoid administering injections into that arm. Um, in fact, you're gonna perform all venipunctures or IV insertions into the other arm or to another region. 
just from their shoulder on down that is off limits um doo -doo -doo -doo, right here there you go we are going to elevate the extremity following the surgical development of the av fistula and this is going to help reduce the swelling so be sure to elevate the arm after they have surgically um, you know or they've done a surgery on the arm get it up if not it's going to swell and it's going to be painful know your baseline let's make sure to have our vitals our labs we definitely need labs and they need to be reviewed just before the person goes in and has dialysis and we're going to look at their weight particularly their wet weight that means before dialysis we are going to make sure that we reviewed their med list because a lot of medications can be washed out in dialysis there is a really good chart in your chapter that talks about which medications are going to be washed out uh, the medications I'm thinking of are seizure drugs maybe um, blood pressure medications and vitamins they're going to be washed out and the seizure drug that I'm thinking of in particular is like gabapentin we have to hold our medications wait till they do dialysis and then we can administer their medication so it's very important to know if they are an AM dialysis or a PM dialysis some nurses that I know don't even look at it and they just see nine o'clock on the MAR and they go ahead and administer medications to the patient that's not the best thing to do we're supposed to know what the medications are um, and know if they're renally cleared or not and if they're renally cleared you kind of hold them now that being said some doctors actually want I had one doctor who wanted this patient to have vancomycin and that is a nephrotoxic drug so you know what he said he said I want this drug to be started while they are in dialysis and I want this patient to be given um, this medication slowly throughout dialysis so they get a little bit of it but then it gets washed out too that was a nephrologist who ordered that one I guess they can do that they're very smart all right last thing I need to talk about uh, is aneurysms or steel syndrome first let's talk about steel syndrome this just sounds kind of cool so steel syndrome is when a vein after it's been tied to an artery it grows like we want it to but it has overgrown and becomes so large that actually all of the blood that's coming down the artery instead of you know part of it going into the little man-made fistula and part of it going down to the fingers <gasps> Ooh, unfortunately the vein has grown so big the fistula has grown so big that it actually steals the blood it steals the blood right out of the artery and no blood actually gets to the fingers and to the wrist and to the lower extremity and that is called steel syndrome if somebody has steel syndrome you're going to notice on your assessment on your you know assessment of the arms we know you're going to do that they have cold fingers um, you know it's going to be numb it's going to be cold numb their cap refill is going to be slow as compared to the other arm you may I've seen one person had such bad steel syndrome that their fingers became gangrenous right yep one done rotted off because <laughs> um, it got so gangrenous so we must be very very careful and um, to be able to fix this they are going to surgically tie off and recreate the fistula now how do I know if somebody has an aneurysm aneurysms are actually very common to a patient who has a fistula and this occurs when a weak weakened area is being stuck over and over again and it will actually grow and enlarge and sort of like can say encapsulate but like what you think an aneurysm would look like um, a bulge in a vessel if we notice that our patient's fistula is beginning to change shape um, we will probably have to subject them to something called a fistulagram 
and that's where we insert dye into the fistula and we watch how it's flowing through there and they can actually determine then if a person has an aneurysm or a pseudo aneurysm and they will probably do interventions such as a surgically opening up the arm and tying the aneurysm off or b placing a stent um, inside the person's fistula Here is an example of what a dialyzer looks like. So remember how I mentioned the artery and the venous? Well, we're not actually poking an artery, but they just call the blood leaving the body the arterial side. And so whenever it goes, it's going to go all the way through to the membrane. Ooh, that's a bad arrow. And so when it gets to the membrane, blood is going to be running on the inside of this. And what is actually going to be going through here is the dialsalate. Once again, I can't say that word appropriately. This is actually going to be flowing around the blood. It's not mixing with the blood. And this is going to be a prescribed um, formula for that patient. And it's going to sometimes if our patient's diabetic, we are going to have, say, lower sugar in our diacetate because the sugar can actually rise. Now, if our patient's a brittle diabetic, um, sometimes we will put a little bit of extra sugar in somebody's diacetate if they continue to go hypoglycemic during dialysis. So the dialysis nurse has to very much uh, watch their patient during the first couple of times to see how is that pa patient going to react with the current formula and then oftentimes they will uh, report back to the nephrologist who will continue to make changes in the recipe. Oftentimes um, my patient going to dialysis they want me to withhold somebody's insulin if they are going and their sugar is maybe like 140, 150, um, or 160, because dialysis may drop it a little bit, especially if the patient doesn't eat. What else do I want to say? Yep, it doesn't mix. It just runs along the membrane, and the nutrients get switched through the membrane, and da -da -da -da, it goes right on out. What I find is super interesting, and you'll probably read about this, is believe it or not, um, they, nope, I won't go there. Okay, not go there, stay focused, got it. So here's some monitoring things that we have to do when our patient is uh, receiving dialysis. So in that moment, we are the dialysis nurse, here's what we're gonna do. Um, first, we are going to monitor for complications during it. Uh, a common complication is infiltration. This is where the needles, maybe the patient's moving, maybe they're confused, and the needle will sort of dislodge itself from the graft or from the fistula and be um, delivering the, the blood back to just say the subcutaneous area or maybe if the needle popped out and it's the arterial side, it will be slowly oozing up under the skin. So we always have to watch our sites very closely for infiltration. The next one is um, cramping. Um, a lot of times if we are pulling the blood too fast out of a patient's arm and body, they will actually experience all over body cramps and vomiting. If this is the case, we have to slow it down. Ooh, bleeding at the X. I'm trying to think if there's anything special or unique. Um, anytime there is an alarm on the dialysis unit, the nurse has to tend to that very quickly because there is possibly, um, you know, indication that the circuit could be clotting. And they say that usually about one unit of blood is caught up in the tubing, like the full tubing at one time. And oh my gosh, if that were to clot off, it's like the patient just bled out for a little bit because we can't get the blood back to the patient. So um, circuit clotting is a very big thing that we're looking for. So we're constantly responding to those alarms, uh, air bubbles and blood tubing. 
uh, is an issue, so they're looking for bubbles frequently. The temperature is oftentimes heated to 100 degrees Fahrenheit. That may need adjustment because say our patient's blood pressure is dropping, maybe um, causing hemodilate, uh, vasodilation. So the nurse has to monitor the temperature of the blood and the patient's response to it because sometimes they'll have to cool it off just a teeny bit. Right. So hypotension can happen because of a couple reasons, but if it were to occur, um, as we just kind of explained right up above, we are going to um, administer a very teeny bolus of fluid. And when I say teeny, I mean like 100 mLs or max 250 mLs. We are going to definitely do just a teeny bit of fluid. We're going to slow the fluid rate down. We may even put the patient in Trendelenburg. Uh, another reason patients may have hypotension I don't think I mentioned is if they received antihypertensive prior to dialysis. Like I oftentimes will have a patient's blood pressure of like 180 over 95. I'm going to want to treat that typically, but because they're getting ready to go to dialysis, I will call the dialysis nurse hey, when are you taking this patient? Oh, you're taking them now in the morning shift? Okay, well, I'm gonna withhold their drugs because that person's gonna go to dialysis and immediately when they're hooked up, their volume is gonna start to be depleted and therefore their blood pressure will drop. I know it feels weird to do that, but it's an often unstable patient. But that is the, I guess downside to dialysis is if you try to treat their blood pressure and then they go to dialysis, you might overdo it. Let's see if there's anything else I would like to say about hypertension. Oh, okay. Um, we're going to slow the rate of the dialysis. Um, we already know to replace it. We know to lay their head down. Um, if somebody's hypotension is so severe, we may even discontinue it for that moment. I know they need it. There is a couple other options that you really will learn about next semester. There is a uh, option to basically do a 24 hour dialysis. Yeah, usually you're in ICU for that one. But anyway, uh, blood sugar. So the patient very well is prone to hypoglycemia. So what do we do with hypoglycemic patient? Well, we're gonna add sugar to the diacylate. Um, that's kind of a quick solution or they don't usually allow eating during dialysis. And the reason is because they often get nauseous during, di uh, during dialysis. So maybe they can get a good snack prior to dialysis. But yeah, they don't typically eat during dialysis. No, they don't eat at all really. Um, okay, we're going to monitor for bleeding at the site and for bleeding anywhere else. We actually are going to administer heparin uh, to our patient during this time. And that is um, always got the tendency to go to the other extreme where our patient's going to become too anticoagulated. So monitor for bleeding, say from their nose, from their mouth. Um, I don't think they're going to make any urine, but rectally. We shouldn't just start oozing from places or from maybe from their current IV site. Okay, see if there's anything else. Talked about anticoagulants, heparin. Um, if, I can't believe I almost forgot this. If a patient does have infiltration right up here, one of the interventions we can do is rest the fistula. Uh, we may have to, depending upon how bad the infiltration is, we might be able to restick a different area, or if it's so severe, um, we can let the patient go 24 hours without dialysis, and we're going to apply ice to the fistula. Um, and then after ice for the first 24 hours, then we're going to transition to warm compresses. Okay. Do you guys know, I apologize for back going back and forth. Do you know the antidote to heparin? Hmm. 
answer is protamine sulfate. That's right. This is if case we need to reverse the heparin that we've given our patient. Uh, and there's also a lab level that we can check just to see if they're too anticoagulated or not. Answer is the um, PTT. Yep, PTT. Partial thromboplastin time. Okay. I believe that's it for this one. Yep. All right. So our patient has returned to us after they've had dialysis and no joke, I am so tickled I found this picture because this is exactly how they look and feel after dialysis. On their way back, oftentimes the, not often, always, the dialysis nurse will measure and compare their wet weight to their dry weight. And they will use that weight difference to let me know how many liters they've pulled off. In fact, they will call and report this to the floor nurse. They'll say, hey, uh, we pulled off you know, 2.6 liters and you know they got that weight. Uh, you got, it's not because they measured how many mLs they pulled off the patient, it's because they weighed the patient and one kilogram equals one liter of fluid. So what are we gonna do? We are gonna avoid any invasive procedures four to six hours after dialysis. This is because they just received a dose of heparin and they're going to bleed a little bit. So only pat, poke them if you absolutely have to. But otherwise, um, you know, if you do have to, you're gonna have to hold pressure for a very long time. They, patients do have the tendency to go hypotensive when they return to the floor, especially if they're new to dialysis. So you're gonna do the usual, you're gonna lower the uh, client's head of bed, and we can give them little small boluses of saline, maybe 100 to 250 mLs of fluid. There is such a thing called the disequilibrium syndrome. Uh, this is where they appear so zonked and it can happen either during or after dialysis. And this is caused by too rapid of a change between the BUN and the creatinine and the uh, electrolytes and the fluid volume. The body just can't handle that. So they're going to get nauseous, maybe a little bit dizzy. They may possibly vomit, get some somewhat restless. So we can administer phenytoin to this patient and maybe even Ativan. Now, if they have severe disequilibrium syndrome, we are going to have them exhibit signs and symptoms of cerebral edema and increased intracranial pressure. So our neuroassessment findings are going to be pretty obvious. They're gonna be lethargic, maybe in a comatose state, and they may even possibly seize on us. Early recognition of disequilibrium syndrome include, um, you know, includes all of that. Uh, things that I mentioned, um, we will want to, you know, replace some fluid if possible, but definitely we're just going to manage their seizures and report this to the dialysis nurse so next time they can slow the flow and reduce the symptom onset and severity. Mm. Who's going to get it? Older people. <laughs> yep. Who's on dialysis? Older people, <laughs> I know, uh, too much. This is just a short list of the additional complications of somebody with hemodialysis. Um, every single patient before they start dialysis and intermittently during dialysis, they are actually gonna be tested for HIV, Hep B and Hep C, as well as HIV. So that is considered routine screening for these patients. Reason being is they are in a very um, confined space where nurses are poking, there's blood uh, products, vials being taken, and you know nurses have to use extremely good techniques. So A, they don't test them, you know, poke themselves, and B, they don't transmit it to another patient. And we will make sure our patient gets um, epipoetin. They usually get that once a week, epipoetin alpha, to help increase their red blood cells. 
Okay, moving on to peritoneal dialysis. Now, I think this is just fascinating. I mean, how do you figure this out? That guy, her woman, smart, very smart. Well, peritoneal dialysis involves installation of hypertonic diacylate solution into the peritoneal cavity. Yes. So we are going to allow this solution to go into the peritoneal cavity as ordered by the provider. And then it's going to dwell for a period of time. And then it's going to drain right back out. And when it drains out, it's taking all of the body's waste products because the peritoneum will be the membrane that I guess your kidneys should be doing and the dialysis machine should be doing. Isn't that crazy? So well, the client definitely needs to know all about the procedure. We need to let them know that they're going to feel very, very full when the diacylate, um, dialysate, there we go, dialysate is coming in whenever it's, you know, being inserted into them. They are going to be very uncomfortable for about the first week and then it gets better over time. To be able to uh, do peritoneal dialysis, our patient must not have multiple surgeries or multiple abdominal infections. In fact, if you think back about our big risk for patients who have periton peritonitis, one of the big causes of peritonitis is... Oh, you want me to say it or did you say it? Because I, I wasn't sure if you said it. Okay, I'll say it. For <laughs> peritoneal dialysis catheter. Oh, sorry. Okay. By myself talking, it just makes you a little crazy. Okay. This, because it doesn't cause massive fluid shifts, we really would hope that our older adults are good candidates for this. Sometimes they are not, but um, this is the easiest and most tolerated for a patient uh, uh, who's of advanced age. Um, if somebody is not able to tolerate anticoagulants, maybe they have constant GI bleeds from overuse of NSAIDs, and that's why our kidneys are here in the first place, um, we may go ahead and just do peritoneal dialysis. Maybe their vascular access is all gone, such as, um, you know, that patient in the video. Well, all right, anyway, maybe their vascular access sites are all used up. And if our patient um, has chronic infections and they're unable to do, um, you know, because of all of the antibiotics and, well, I think I'm rambling. Yes, I'm rambling. You get the point. Ramble, ramble, ramble. All right. Here we have two very common types of peritoneal dialysis. Um, this one right here, the continuous ambulatory peritoneal dialysis, this is nice if somebody, say, works from home. They do it seven days a week, usually throughout the day, four to eight hours, and they can walk around. Usually they are hooked up to this. They stay hooked up. Um, I have, when I've read about this, the patient can disconnect for a little bit, walk around, do their thing, and then connect themselves back up. <clears throat> but they kind of have their normal activities. They just plug in and go. <laughs> now, this one I know is a very nice option for patients because um, there is a 30 minute exchange cycle. Oh, I circled the wrong one, didn't I? I just talked about that. Here we go. Okay. Yeah. Automated PD. That's what I'm talking about now. Okay. So automated PD is where they have a 30 minute exchange cycle where it's repeated over and over again for about eight to 10 hours while the client is sleeping. Lots of advantages. Um, not only, I mean, it's, it's the least disruptive to somebody's schedule. Um, they are, there are reduced incidences of peritonitis because the person's not connecting, disconnecting, connecting, disconnecting, and their uh, larger volumes of solution can be instilled. Most patients are going to prefer this one right here, the automated APD, because they're sleeping and it just does it. All right, we have the continuous cycle right here. This is where somebody is connected. Um, 
Well, also whenever the person, it, it oh, oh my gosh. The continuous cycle peritoneal dialysis really kind of occurs in a 24 hour period. So the patient is gonna have, uh, you know, all of the exchanges at night and the final exchange is left in to dwell during the day. And then the patient is then gonna hook up and then let the fluid out during the end of the day. And then they do it all over again. They do have a lot of adaptive devices to help people who have poor dexterity, maybe poor vision and reduced arm strength and mobility. So what are some teachings that we need to do for somebody who has PD, peritoneal dialysis? Uh, let them know that we need to assess their weight, their dry weight and their wet weight. We need to warn them about the fullness when the dialysate is infusing. Um, there may be that initial discomfort, but it goes away over time. Uh, we need to encourage them to make sure that they are compliant getting their serum electrolytes checked, their creatinine, their BUN, and their glucose. Um, we need to determine the patient's ability to perform this and follow sterile technique. That's very important. And assess their level of alertness. What are their past experiences with dialysis? Do they understand the procedure? We're going to monitor their vital signs frequently during the initial phases of dialysis. And then afterward, it's gonna become a little bit more routine. Now, this solution has a lot of sugar in it. So we can anticipate um, a sugar spike. So oftentimes they will have to uh, use a little bit more insulin or they will have to alter their diet so their sugar doesn't go up. And as always, measure how much went in and how much went out. I know this looks a little bit overwhelming, but it's not too bad. Stay with me. We're gonna monitor for the quality of the effluent. The effluent is the drainage that is coming out of the catheter. It should be clear to light yellow. The amount should be equal or exceed the amount that flowed in. Now, it will technically be a little pink and bloody whenever it's first inserted, but after the first week or so, it should go back to that straw color. What we don't want to see is it be cloudy, if it's milky, or maybe even if it's brown. Brown would indicate that there is a, perf a bowel perforation. Frothy is sometimes a normal finding too. Can I have a little froth on my cappuccino? No? Okay. Uh, we're going to make sure to monitor, monitor for signs of infection at the access site. This includes redness, warmth, tenderness, pain, and once again, cloudy effluent. That may be signs and symptoms of peritonitis developing or localized cellulitis. Below are complications of retention. Retention. Signs and symptoms of retention are respiratory distress, abdominal pain, and insufficient outflow. And I'll tell you in a second how to fix that. We want to definitely um, warm the dialysate prior to instilling. Let's warm it up some. We're going to avoid the use of microwaves. This can uh, cause uneven heating and even burns. That would not be good. Hmm, I actually skipped one. We want to check the access site for wetness. We're gonna check the access site for wetness. Now, we are probably gonna be okay if the first week or two it's wet, the dressing is wet, that's normal, but it should not continue to remain wet. That means malplacement or a kinked tube. We're gonna follow the prescribed times for infusion, dwell, and outflow. When we look at the prescription, it looks something like this, 10 slash 30 slash 15. And those are usually the minutes for infusion, dwell, and outflow. 
we are going to maintain surgical asepsis of the catheter insertion site and when accessing the catheter. Oftentimes, the nurse will wear a mask, the patient will wear a mask, and anybody else in the room will wear a mask. We're going to keep the outflow bag lower than the client's abdomen. This allows the effluent to drain out by gravity and to prevent reflux. We are going to reposition the client if inflow or outflow is inadequate. If something is not flowing in, check the tubing for kinks or if the patient is constipated, which is a very common uh, tubing obstruction problem, we want to resolve it by getting the patient some laxatives and repositioning the patient. I have actually found out that one patient said to be able to have the solution flow out better, he would turn on his side and massage his stomach, kind of like using his hand and sweep over his belly, moving the solution to where the catheter is. Neat, huh? Um, we can carefully milk the peritoneal dialysis catheter if a fibrin clot has formed inside the tube. Milking means you just carefully pinch it up and down to try to help the clot break up into smaller pieces. Lastly, lastly the patient needs to consult with home health care for home management and teaching. We have some special considerations for our patients who are on peritoneal dialysis. One of them is protein loss. Because of the way that the dialysate is going to be working inside the peritoneum, protein unfortunately is going to be moving across the membrane and out to the effluent. Well, what are we going to do about our patient's protein levels? Well, we need to make sure to increase their dietary intake of protein. Do you remember how many grams of protein they should have per kilogram per day? The answer is 1.2 to 1.5. They have the least restrictive amount of protein they consume, and that's because most of it, not most of it, a lot of it is lost through the act of peritoneal dialysis. To make sure our patient doesn't get too protein deficient, we are going to monitor their serum albumin levels. We can do that either every three months or every six months until the person stabilizes. <clears throat> do you remember how we have a complication of hyperglycemia. This is due to the composition of the dialysate. Well, we can either do some diet modifications or we can begin to administer insulin for better glycemic control. The last subject we're gonna cover is kidney transplantation. In-stage kidney disease does not mean a life uh, left lived on dialysis. We may be able to offer them the life-sustaining treatment of kidney transplant. Transplantation may greatly improve the quality of life for a person who is otherwise going to be dependent every single day. Here's the kicker. We gotta find a match. We can either have a living donor or we could have a donated kidney from somebody who is deceased. They call them non-heart beating. Uh, donors. When we do a tissue match, we are going to not only match their blood type, but about 21 other, um, oh, it's right here, 21 other factors called HLAs. These are going to make sure that the kidney is going to be accepted as best as possible, and we want them to match as best as possible. That's why it's so challenging to find a perfect match, is because there's so many different combinations and as you see here, a donor from a living relative will actually have the greatest chance of acceptance and the graft will survive for longer. Older adults are more likely to have advanced heart disease and malignancies. That's why it is contraindicated that somebody greater than 70 is not eligible for a transplant. They are the less ideal candidates, I should say. I have some celebrities here who actually are recipients of donated kidneys. Here I have George Lopez. 
he got a kidney from his wife, actually, who happened to be a compatible match, and then unfortunately ended up in divorce. That is very sad. Um, then I have here a picture of Tracy Morgan. He is an actor. Um, you may know him from Saturday Night Live. He actually got a kidney from his girlfriend, who is now his ex. He actually had diabetes. Some other contraindications I would like to point out is if somebody is actively receiving treatment for cancer, maybe somebody has a substance abuse problem, if somebody has chronic or a systemic uh, infection, such as HIV or Hep B, they're ineligible. And, and if somebody has an active infection, they'll need to get that under control and the person has to be medically stable. Now, these are two areas where if a candidate has diabetes, the diabetes has to be well controlled. Our patients who are going to be on the list for waiting for a kidney are going to be taking prophylactic antibiotics every day because you never know when you're going to get the phone call that a kidney is waiting for you and you have to be able to get to the hospital within so many hours. Usually it's within 12 or so or a day. Um, we need to make sure that the client is accepting of being on lifelong immunosuppressive therapy and they will have to follow those protocols that come with immunosuppression. They need to make sure to quit smoking, not the day before surgery. This is to be even on the transplant list. They have to um, not be uh, a smoker. Their blood pressure has to be in control, and we already talked about their sugar. Nothing worse than transplanting a kidney and then have the person not be able to take care of themselves because they have other behaviors which are going to damage the new re newly received kidney. And just before a patient is going to be transplanted, they actually get all of the electrolytes and everything stable as best as possible. So dialysis usually happens just before surgery takes place. Post kidney transplant, our patient is going to go to a uh, ICU unit for a couple of days or so. And while they're there, the nurse is gonna probably do vital signs every 15 minutes initially, and then advance to every hour, obviously following the institutional protocol. But that usually happens, they go every hour after the first two hours or so. We're gonna maintain the client's blood pressure in a very tight window. We don't want it too high and we don't want it too low. The nurse is gonna to need to do eyes and nose hourly. That's a lot of effort, but it must be done because if the kidneys begin to um, drop in their urine output, the nurse would be able to catch it if they're watching it every hour. How much should they pee every hour? Great question. Urine output should be greater than 30 milliliters an hour, and we are going to notify the provider if, uh, of oliguria as evidenced by urine output of roughly 100 to 400 ml in a 24-hour time period. We are going to monitor for abrupt decreases in urine output. That can indicate rejection, maybe tissue injury, or worst case scenario, thrombosis of the renal artery or obstruction of the renal system. Nothing like a newly placed kidney um, having the artery uh, decrease its blood supply to the kidney. Urine appearance um, is going to be initially bloody or pink. So don't expect much out of the urine color. Gradually, maybe in a few days to several weeks, it's gonna get less and less bloody and actually look like regular urine. Daily, we're going to run urinalysis checks and we're looking for proteins, white blood cells, the level of red blood cells, ketones, glucose, the specific gravity, and the pH. We're going to weigh our patient and that's going to assist us in monitoring our patient's fluid status. Are they excreting the urine volume or are they holding on to it? 
we're going to make sure to monitor their fluid and electrolyte imbalances specifically for hypervolemia, hypovolemia, and the two others which are very deadly to the new kidney, hypokalemia and hyponatremia. Now this could be harmful to the patient too. Towards the end here, doo -doo -doo -doo, infection. Uh, we are looking for things such as dyspnea, fever, incisional drainage, and redness. And you know what's interesting? If you click back to our original picture, we are going to leave the old kidney in place and we're going to insert the new kidney in the, um, in the front of the stomach down in the groin. So we're actually going to implant the new kidney deep in the pelvis area. Yep, and the old one's going to be hooked up and it's just hanging out there. It's usually going to atrophy in a few months to years and just kind of sits there. But the new kidney is going to be protected and the incision is going to be on the lower abdomen, either the right or the left. It just depends. Um, the nurse needs to be looking for early signs and even late signs of organ rejection. What does that look like? Double check your book to look in the tables. But a good example is fever, hypertension, and additional pain at the transplant site. This one is going to probably not be unique to a kidney transplant, but monitor the surgical dressing for bloody drainage. If you do see excessive bloody drainage, this is indicative of hemorrhage or hematoma formation. Apply pressure and let the doctor know immediately. Now our patient's gotten a little bit better and they're getting ready to go out into the world. What do they need to know? Well, we're gonna teach them to monitor for signs and symptoms of rejection and to contact the primary care provider immediately. Once again, please review the signs and symptoms of the different types of rejection in your book. Their diet recommendations are gonna be definitely less restrictive than what they used to be when they, are, uh, when they had the kidney failure. We need to make sure that they are on a low fat diet diet to decrease their cholesterol, high fiber to avoid the constipation um, that usually is associated with the medications from being with a new kidney, um, and increase protein to promote healing and to rebuild and maintain muscle mass. They are actually gonna resume a normal intake of potassium, calcium, and phosphorus. No restrictions there. Now, Sodium restriction is important, but that's because we want to make sure that the person's blood pressure is completely normal and we don't have any issues with fluid retention. We know they're going to be on prednisone probably for life, and if that's the case, they are prone to fluid retention and hypertension. So that's why we have to do a sodium restriction for life. We're going to encourage our patient to avoid concentrated sugars or even uh, simple carbohydrates, and this is because of the effect of prednisone on our blood sugar. It tends to raise our blood sugar, so we don't want to add any other um, factors to raise it, and we want to have nice, good glycemic control. We are going to make sure our patient is on magnesium supplements, like magnesium oxide every day. This is because one of the in uh, anti-rejection medications called cyclosporine, also known as neoral. This one can reduce the patient's magnesium levels and we don't want the magnesium levels to drop. So keep taking the cyclosporine or the neoral, but take magnesium too. One big drug uh, food interaction is grapefruit juice. Doo -doo -doo -doo. A patient needs to avoid grapefruit products or grapefruit juice when they're on cyclosporine. This can actually cause increased cyclosporine levels in the blood. Activity recommendations. Our patient is going to have to avoid contact sports that may injure the newly transplanted kidney. Even though it's buried deep in the pelvis where it's protected, it can unfortunately be prone to injury uh, if the patient is not very careful. 
<clears throat> and doing risky things like contact sports. You only got one kidney, bud. Don't mess that one up, too. <laughs> um, we're going to encourage our patient to increase to uh, activity as tolerated. Usually physical therapy can help with that. Congratulations, you have reached the end of this PowerPoint. As always, please reach out to me if you have any questions. Otherwise, you are finished.